Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey. Here's an interesting video, Game Dev Mistakes That Destroy Your Game. Three years of work on my game and nothing. No sales, no wish lists, no money for the Steam holiday sale. Wow, right away, yeah, that's tough, but sadly that is not uncommon. If anything, my advice to you would be don't spend three years working on your game, especially not your very first game. When you're just starting out and you're trying to learn, you really want to be able to learn with as little risk as possible. So yeah, for your very first game, my advice is don't go anything further than something like two to three months. I made a video quite a long time ago on seven steps you can take to become an indie dev. And in the beginning, I do say make tons and tons of games because you will learn so much more by actually finishing and publishing a bunch of games. You'll learn so much more than just working on one massive game over several years. Right now, I'm working on my next Steam game, which is meant to be a three to four month full-time project. Depending on your skills and experience, you can get quite a lot done in a few months if you have a clear plan. I don't know what I did wrong. I need a Christmas miracle. All right, this game is gonna be amazing. I think I'll just start with all my art assets. Holy sh And this is the first mistake. Who are you? I'm you, and I'm here to save you from all of your beginner game dev mistakes. I'm just making my art assets. What's wrong with that? Exactly. You spend way too much time on your art during the prototype phase. Sure, yeah, that's an interesting tip. You should definitely make a quick prototype in order to actually validate the idea. However, at the same time, some game ideas are heavily influenced by the art. So depending on what game you're trying to make, it might not necessarily be a terrible idea to spend some time making the art assets. Although at the same time, when I say spend some time, I don't mean spend months. Maybe depending on the genre, it might be wise to spend perhaps the very first week working on nothing but art assets, trying to get the mood of your game. If you're going for something like a visual novel or a point-and-click game, something where the art is absolutely essential. On those kinds of games, that might not necessarily be a mistake. But yeah, for most games, if you're making a platformer, a strategy game, an action game, something like that, then getting the gameplay up and running as quickly as possible, that is definitely going to be much more important than spending tons of time on making polished art. Not to mention that as the game develops, you will probably replace the art anyway, so yeah, there are some exceptions, but in general, yeah, definitely don't spend way too long working on art right at the very beginning. By focusing on art during this early phase, you have less time to devote to making sure the gameplay within the prototype is actually fun. I don't even use those assets. I completely changed my art style later on. Yeah, that's the thing that happens, especially if you spend way too long in a game to the point where your skills actually improve and then you want to make, you want to redraw the assets once again with better skills. So yeah, do not go overboard on the art right at the very beginning. So I should just work on the ugly gray box prototype? And yep, definitely do spend time working on an ugly gray box prototype. The thing is, if your ugly gray box prototype, if that thing is fun to play, then when you add all kinds of visual sparkle effects and polish on top, it will be even more fun to play. So one good technique is definitely make tons of prototypes, make them super quickly, and then just experiment and see which one of those actually plays great. Because again, if it does play great whilst looking terrible, then it will feel extremely awesome when you finally add all kinds of polish and visuals. Gameplay loop instead, you would have had a much stronger gameplay foundation. Hence the first mistake, not focusing on gameplay early. Making a game involves a lot of moving parts, and it's extremely easy to get distracted by all the things that need to be built. Making a finished character asset and polished textures may make the prototype more visually appealing, but the main thing that will make people wishlist, buy, and play your game is the game part. Visuals may grab someone's attention, but the gameplay will make them stay. Also related to this is when you're trying to make some kind of demo or perhaps a vertical slice in order to get funding from a publisher. In those cases, this comes after this phase, after the prototyping phase. When you have the game nice and solid, it can be wise to spend a bunch of time just polishing just a tiny sliver of the game, just making what is called a vertical slice. Just doing that, getting that all polished up as much as possible in order to hopefully get some funding or maybe start to promote your Steam page. Ooh, two years. Hey, I'm back. What are you working on? Oh God, I made it just in time. I followed your advice and, and focused on gameplay. I'm just doing some, some play testing, which is super great, but my brother in game dev, you're just asking your friends and family to play test. Well, yeah, but asking strangers is hard and scary. And who's gonna play your game? And do you think your friends and family are gonna give you solid critiques? Yeah, I guess not. So what should I do? Well, for starters, ask your friends and family, but take their feedback with a grain of salt. 
Yeah, friends and family are definitely great for a first initial thing, but you always got to keep in mind where that feedback comes from. Always keep in mind that feedback is always going to be slightly biased towards the positive side because your friends and family, they're your friends, so they're not going to be brutally honest, at least not as brutally honest as actual Steam players will be when you finally release your game. So do get them to play your game and read through their feedback, but do keep that positive bias in mind. I just had a similar example to this when I recently released the Steam Neck Fest demo for my game. Most of the feedback that I got were actually from people that found this channel. And if they watch this channel, if they enjoy the videos that I do, they will definitely be much more biased towards the positive side rather than the regular Steam audience. You want strangers, anyone and everyone to test your game. Playtesting often gets pushed aside during the development process or you put it at the very end. But in reality, you want people to be testing your game early and often. Playtesting is really market research. It lets you know how people are receiving your game, your mechanics, your art style, and gives you an idea where you might be blind to certain issues with your game. So get initial impressions, favorite parts, parts they hated, and things they think are missing. Every piece of information is useful. Yeah, great list of things. Definitely get their initial impressions. With so many games nowadays, you really got to hook the player as soon as possible. Especially since nowadays going on a Steam Festival is super important. And on a Steam Festival, you are providing a free demo and you are competing with tens of thousands of other demos. So for that, you really got just a few minutes in order to really hook the player. So initial impressions are extremely important. The favorite parts, also really important in order to figure out what people like about your game. So you can do more of those. Least favorite parts, so you can either rework the design in order to make them not the least favorite, in order to make them a bit better or perhaps just cut them out entirely. At some point, there are some mechanics that just don't work no matter how much you want them to. So in order to improve the game, sometimes cutting a mechanic is really the best approach. And things missing, like if lots of your players are telling you, oh, I wish I could pause the game to take my time and go things slowly. That is really great feedback on things that might be missing, that might even be super easy to add, but you might have never thought about, and that might make your game much, much better. You don't need to implement every single idea or change, but at least be aware of how your game is being received. Yeah, definitely also that's another thing. Do not just blindly implement every idea that anyone tells you. Remember that you are the developer, so you know best what your game should be like. You know with the idea that you have in your head and what you're actually trying to accomplish. So always keep that in mind. Make sure you don't implement every single idea that you get. If you do, then the final game will just be a mishmash of different ideas that might not go together. In the end, it's really up to you as the developer to figure out which ideas to take and which ones you should ignore. Okay, so focus on gameplay and have people test it so you can refine it. Right, and while you do the play testing, you're also getting networking contacts for future tests and potential buyers once the game is finished. So in general, play testing really good, asking more than just your friends and family to play test your game, that is extremely good. But obviously the big problem is where do you find those people? And that can be quite a bit tricky. You can perhaps look into Reddit. There are some communities that might play your game. There are some discords with lots of developers who play each other's games. You might look into itch.io. There might be some forums and some areas over there to find a community. Or alternatively, you can kind of do what I've done, which is make a YouTube channel, grow that YouTube channel over time with whatever game dev related videos you have, like perhaps devlogs or something like that. And then you have an audience that if you ask them to test your game, they might be able to do that. So plenty of options to find playtesters other than just your friends and family. Okay, uh, I remember this. I was crunching, trying to get all the features working together. It kept breaking every time I, I added something. Yeah, this, this plugin won't work. It says it works for massively multiplayer RPG action adventure racing open world VR games. Okay, maybe I added one too many features. Yeah, scope creep is yet another beginner game dev mistake. I myself, I'm definitely not immune to that. When I started making Flash games, around my third Flash game, I suddenly had the brilliant idea, why don't I make a massive MMO game? It was meant to be something with like cops and robbers. So it was going to have dozens or hundreds of people on the same map. Some people would try to rob some banks, others would try to stop them. Obviously, after working on that project for a bunch of months, it didn't go anywhere, so I ended up abandoning it. But yeah, this is definitely a big problem and you should definitely keep track of it. Make sure you don't go way too overboard. But at the same time, if it does happen, don't get too down on yourself. It seems like this happens to literally everyone. Making games is sometimes like the wild, wild west. A free, open world of opportunity, and that freedom can be a big problem. Yeah, freedom is definitely both a positive and a negative. It's great to be able to do anything. I mean, it's your game, so you can literally add anything you want onto that game. But at the same time, not having any constraints means you might get caught up trying to add things more and more and more, and you never actually end up finishing anything. 
it is indeed a double-edged sword, so always be very careful when you add a new mechanic, when you come up with a new idea. Always think to yourself, okay, does this actually enhance the core idea that I already have? If so, then perhaps that might be a good addition. If not, if it's just something you added just because on a whim you suddenly decide to add some more mechanics. If so, then perhaps it might be wise to keep that on a drawer, put that on a to-do list to play around with in the future in case you have time, but for now focus on actually finishing the core game idea that you have. We all love games, and it might be why you started making games all together. And sometimes you might want to add every single feature from every favorite game you've ever played. So when you're feeling the urge to add a new gameplay feature, ask yourself, does it fit my existing design? If you answered no, then focus on getting what you have to a point where you can add new features. And if you want to add something anyway, prototype it and play test it. Yep, definitely. Great tip, great advice. If you're going to add some brand new mechanic to your game, especially if it's something complex that is going to take quite a bit of effort, perhaps try making just a prototype of that initial idea. Just get the basics up and running in order to actually test, does this idea actually work? Will it actually improve the final game? So remember that when it comes to prototyping, you can prototype not just the actual full game idea, but individual systems. You can always get just the core of it working just enough in order to figure out, does this work? Will this actually improve the game? It brings me to one final piece of advice. While you don't want to introduce too many new features, don't be afraid to borrow from some of your favorite games. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you got into game development, chances are you got into it because you actually enjoy playing games. So definitely look into the games that you play, the things that you enjoy, try to analyze them, try to look at them with a game designer eye and try to see why do those features work? Why do those systems work? What makes them so compelling? That is one great way you can improve your game, play similar games and don't just necessarily copy things, just copy paste, but actually figure out why those mechanics work, why those systems work, and perhaps they might be applicable to your game in some way. You likely got into game development because of the games that inspired you to do so. And sometimes listening to that inspiration can keep you going when the going gets hard. And if you find yourself losing motivation, check out this video to learn how to deal with burnout. All right, that was a great video. Lots of really interesting tips. Definitely mistakes that many people might have uh, fallen for. So if you're a beginner and you're watching this, definitely keep in mind all these mistakes, make sure you don't do them and they will really help you on your game dev journey. All right, so go ahead and watch the original video and subscribe to Stay At Home Dev. I hope you found this interesting. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.